Space, time, technology, and science. It requires unprecedented hard work, but the true pursuit of technology is really to make our lives easier. Or to make the impossible seem possible. To make the best of us. For us to strive to work harder and do things that we never thought were possible. In many ways, it is humanity's greatest achievement to create hardware and tech that is able to do things that we once thought were impossible. The Microsoft Surface Duo does not do these things for our species. Microsoft Surface Duo is a piece of R&D crap that they decided they wanted to start charging money for because they just didn't really know where to take it in this particular direction. And yes, that annoys me. Yes, I am an Apple sheep. Yes, I am biased towards Apple. Am I being unfair towards a first generation product? Absolutely. That's because I paid $1,500 for it. And I have the opinion that if you're spending $1,500 on whether it be a phone, a tablet, whatever the heck the middle ground is on this thing, you can criticize it. If there are bad experiences, you can bring them up. Can you treat something unfairly because you have predetermined opinions? Absolutely. That's totally fair and all in the good spirit of entertainment. The Microsoft Surface Duo has not met my expectations and may I admit, boy were they low in the first place. There was not a high bar set for me unboxing and using the Surface Duo on a daily basis. I assure you, I was really not expecting much. I was mainly just hoping to experiment with the form factor and see if there was any kind of potential here I could find that I was missing from just reading the tech specs online, seeing the reviews and being like, hmm, seems kind of stupid and uh, I don't understand why anyone would want that or pay for something like this, but I wanted to try it myself to see if there was something I was missing and guess what? It was way, way worse than I originally thought it was going to be. So that's why, yep, we're going into Apple Sheep Rant territory today because we need to. Let's begin. <laughs> Let's start out with the design, okay? Because it's cool looking. It's a very premium build. It's made out of high quality materials like glass, which it still doesn't support wireless charging. So why Why did we have to put glass on a phone that doesn't even have Chico? I don't know. If your emphasis with this thing was that, hey, it's a more portable tablet, it's lighter and thinner and you can fit it in your pocket, then why choose glass, all right? All that does is make it easier to shatter and break and you could have made it out of metal and probably had a more matte, like less fingerprint collecting finish. And by the way, that metal would have been lighter and if you're worried about it bending I mean there's a hinge and also this thing's incredibly thin as is seems like youtubers really really care about the thinness of devices all of a sudden I thought we didn't care about that anymore but apparently we do like oh my god it's as thin as the USB-C port the thing is you're never using it like this you're using it like little notebook like excuse me I'm reading a book and it's made of technology so it's cool and that's about the end of the functionality but when you're using it in phone mode like this it is quite thick it's about as thick as my iPhone or when it's in your pocket, it actually takes up quite a bit of space, I'll be honest. I mean, if we're trying to make the argument of foldables helping with portability, when we're talking about width here, it is kind of big in my pocket. It takes up a lot amount of space, and I'm used to carrying around an 11 Pro Max, which is a pretty thick, heavy, big phone as it is, and this one still feels a little bit weird in my pocket. So if you're the type to have small pockets or pants that don't really have a lot of space in them, the Surface Duo I don't think is going to fit that well compared to whatever phone you're currently using because of how wide and square it is. That's the other thing. The aspect ratios on this thing are so bizarre. I don't know why they chose to go with two five and a half inch displays on the inside. It looks like a four by three aspect ratio, but let's be honest, four by three aspect ratios make sense when you're doing split screen and doing several things on the display at once. But the Surface Duo is like by default and there's no way to turn it off. It is a split screen. There is a split down the middle and I do literally mean split. There is, there is space. Like, light will go through the center display here. In a lot of pictures and videos, they don't really make that obvious. The fact that you can see through the gap here, which definitely puts a little bit of a damper on the whole. It's a seamless experience between two displays. No, it, there's literally a seam. Not only is there a bezel between the two and a hinge, there is actually a gap of air, and that is noticeable, especially when you're swiping things or trying to full screen an app that doesn't happen to crash, because I haven't even got to that part of the video yet. Yeah, apps crash. 
cash for me somewhat regularly. I don't know if I'm using it wrong, but something tells me putting a six gigs of RAM in a device that was built for multitasking and running Android, probably a bad idea. Typically phones these days have to put 8.5 terabytes of RAM on Android to allow it to run at least a couple apps at the same time. So I, I find that a little bit important. But anyway, the aspect ratios are not very one hand friendly at all. So you can use it in this like one screen phone mode. That's, that's one way to call it with the fingerprint reader on the side which they didn't want to embed into the power button for some reason i don't know why they couldn't the fingerprint reader is the thickness of the device why not just combine two of these aspects into one sensor like they did on the ipad air a much better deal mind you and you know when we talk about ipad pro versus ipad air this is more expensive than both of those and has worse specs than both of them so i really heavily recommend you look elsewhere if you were looking for this as a secondary phone not as a you know dedicated this is all I need anymore because I'll be able to make phone calls and text messages but also get work done right that's what the duo is for it's getting work done as long as the app doesn't close on you as long as it's not crashing and the software isn't confused out of its mind when you're using the phone like this it's very very hard to reach every aspect of the display it's awkward it's clunky it's sharp because of how thick and boxy it is on the side so if you like using your phone with one hand it's terrible for that because obviously when you unfold it like this it's not gonna be better for one-handed use there's even more display to choose from and it's almost impossible to open the display with one hand so this device requires a lot of your attention and unlike the galaxy z fold 2 it's not something that has an external display in fact not even an external camera there's no camera on the outside of the duo which means in this configuration it is literally useless it is just a fancy looking microsoft ds because it's got the round corners and the hinge and square edges it's just a bunch of glass that's like don't crack don't break me don't drop me because this could end horribly literally like in this configuration it's just supposed to be microsoft logo wow it's so beautiful look at those four squares there's there's no way to use it like this which honestly i've noticed that's kind of a rare thing these days to have like a form function or a posture as microsoft calls it this particular posture is completely useless i guess maybe for the benefit of protecting the inside displays so you don't have to worry about them scratching as much <laughs> Yay! Could have bought a screen protector for three dollars, or you can buy the Surface Duo, like the Z Fold 2. You can still use the device when it's folded up, or an iPhone because there's no folds on it. You can use it because there's only one posture, there's only one configuration. But yeah, opening it with one hand is uh, pretty pretty much pointless because you're not going to use the phone like this, and also trying to unlock. The device at the same time by putting your fingerprint on the side there got it problem solved so absolutely not something i would recommend for replacing your phone also for the fact that it does not support nfc in the world of the pandemic where we're trying to move everything towards more and more contactless and mobile pay and that kind of thing the surface duo is not rocking nfc which iphones have had for years android phones have had for years apple watches have had for years i'm very very shocked that they just decided nfc was not worth it for any particular reason and if you're argument is well true you pay for things on your watch anyway well guess what the apple watch requires an iphone so it's not really an excuse here and that's a terrible excuse because just because you're used to spending an additional 400 to 500 dollars on another accessory doesn't mean that the default configuration of a device should not include certain things that's like saying the iphone doesn't need volume rockers because you can change the volume of music with the apple watch digital crown it's like yeah you can but that doesn't mean that everyone who buys an iphone phone gets an apple watch same thing just because you buy a surface duo that should not assume that you have a smart watch and for that reason the watch has to pick up on things that microsoft couldn't afford to put in here for some reason so once you open the display the depression and anxiety really starts to crank up to 11 because you have these super chunk bezels and asymmetrical design through the roof so on one side you've got the earpiece so before all of you tell me this isn't a phone or it's not meant to replace a phone that is not a dedicated speaker it is literally an earpiece that part of the design is literally just meant to be held up against your ear so it's not a tablet if you're telling me to take a phone call like this and then a camera to the right of that and the flash that's right a forward facing flash most smartphones these days if you want to take a flash on the front you just light up the display full brightness for a second but with this they wanted a dedicated sensor this giant white dot in the top part of the bezel that's going to be there at all times and the hilarious part about it to me is that when you open the lock screen it actually has a flash button and 
and a camera button just built into the lock screen I guess because that's what iPhones do they've got the flashlight and the camera button so Microsoft was like that's what iPhones do I guess that's what the surface should do but they forgot for a second that the flash is still on the freaking front part of the phone and that means that when you're on your lock screen like this and you press the flashlight you just blind yourself thank you Microsoft you know it would have been so easy via software to just be like hey they're using the front part of the phone so that means if we turn on the flashlight it should just light up the back side of the device you have a giant screen right here the Apple watch kind of figured this out years ago if you want to do a flashlight feature you can tap it through control center and then when you point it away from you the display will get really really bright and it works it lights up rooms pretty well but I suppose the brightness of the surface duo is really bad I've used it outside a couple of times and it's definitely not on par with my far cheaper iPhone when it comes to nits so unimpressed with the display brightness maybe that's why they couldn't do the flashlight thing I'm suggesting but what's hilarious is that that flashlight widget is there no matter what even if you're using the display in its unfolded configuration and you're like hmm let's light up the oh that's right I can blind myself lovely it would have been so so difficult I know it would have been so very incredibly hard for them to just put a camera on the outside you know having a phone with with cameras on the front and on the back is so complicated although we have had them around since 2011 hey guess what if unbox therapy gets to call the iPhone 10 are depressing because it has the same pixel density as the iPhone 4 even though there's so many other benefits to a display than just pixel density anyway the truth is the surface duo has the same number of cameras as the iPhone 3g that's right even the iPhone 4 from 2011 had more cameras than the surface duo did and may I add that was incredibly cheaper but okay it's different because there's a hinge right hinge makes it all okay so that means that when you're taking a picture with the front-facing camera you can do this but let's say something else is going on behind you and you want to take pictures and videos out there oh well you have to flip the device around double tap this side and if it starts reading my okay it's it's not listening I tried really trying to let the device know that I want to switch to this side it's very simple guys let me tell you okay double tap double tap double tap to switch <gasps> there are so many examples of this type of software malfunction that I was not able to include in the review as b-roll but let me tell you it's been buggy as heck it's been clunky there's been inconsistent animations but point being uh, if you want to use this camera you have to flip it around it's basically like like carrying around your iMac everywhere with you because that has one camera and the quality of it is also about on par with what you would expect from most webcams see on the website Microsoft claims that this camera can shoot 4k at 60 video which is to be expected given phones that are $400 today can do that so you'd expect the phone that's $1,400 to be capable of doing that too right well either the camera was not designed to record at resolutions and frame rates that high or the Snapdragon 855 which is nearing two years old is not capable of playing it back very well because there's been several times I've recorded video with this thing and then tried to watch it and it just freezes it's unable to play it it will not show the video and sometimes I'll have better luck if I take the video off of the duo and play it on some other device like play it on Twitter or play it on an iPad or like upload it to the cloud and watch it on a separate device and then I can watch it more clearly but I just love vlogging on the Microsoft Surface Duo it's able to record in glorious 4k at 60 frames a second it's the most beautiful camera you will ever see on a smartphone in your entire life and that is undisputable the genius of it is it only has one camera which means the same amazing camera you see take all of those rear facing shots is the exact same camera you're gonna be seeing taking those front facing shots in another way the iMac from 10 years ago that webcam on a phone and it's fifteen hundred dollars I know you're welcome but still no Windows Hello, interestingly enough. Just the processing power in the Duo is not strong enough to hold up the own video it's recording, and that's why it is definitely not 60 frames a second. It's choppy, the autofocus doesn't know what it's doing, and when it comes to pictures, they're about as bad as you'd expect from a front-facing camera. It's like, what if you just didn't have a rear-facing camera in your phone, right? What if you just had the front-facing one, and the front-facing one wasn't very good in the first place? And that's it. That's your only option. So, especially if you're in a situation where you're using the dual display, and you're 
want to take a picture. You're like, oh, oh, look, something's happening. You gotta flip around like this and hope the device remembers to uh, switch the display over because oftentimes it doesn't. So if you care any any bit at all about the camera in your phone, the Surface Duo is a hot steaming pile of garbage. But what is the Duo good for, right? We've got these two displays attached together and we have dual monitors, right? We like having two screens at our desk. So why is having it in a smartphone or a smart tablet that different? Well, it's because it's Android, ladies and gentlemen. And there's a reason that Android tablets don't sell very well. It's because Android doesn't adopt very well to larger screens like this. When you have these awkward aspect ratios, you actually don't get much content because typically a lot of what we do on our phones is scrolling and it's more vertical because we're using them with one hand and they're fitting in our pockets. So when you have these more square aspect ratios, but they're not big displays, like even an iPad mini has a bigger display than just one individual version of the duo screen, then you're only able to display like one tweet at a time when scrolling through Twitter or when you're browsing the news, you can't stuff that much information on a display this wide. It's just not optimized for it and Android doesn't really know how to handle it. So your real best bet is to really stretch applications to take up both displays, in which case it actually kind of feels somewhat nice. I'll give a compliment here. This was the use case I found myself using the Duo for the most, was the fact that I could fit this device into my pocket and then stretch an app to take up an entire display and it would be, you know, like using an iPad mini. It's like an eight inch screen. But the problem is we have this giant, giant gap that literally lets light through and it's a ridge. It's like way worse than just a crease down the middle. And that makes quite a noticeable dent in your content. It covers up text, your finger feels it as you're scrolling and it's just a noticeable line through the middle of the screen, just like this obstacle in the middle of the YouTube video is very distracting and it bothers you. And I'm not gonna keep it on for very long because that would throw people off. So that's what kind of scrolling with the full screen mode with the Duo is like. And when it comes to watching content or media of any kind, as I've seen a few people that want to get the Duo say, wow, I love that it has tent mode. I love that it can prop itself up like this. That's so cool. First of all, a pop socket would be much, much cheaper and have much better hardware with the phone budget you're looking at right now. If you want to spend $1,400 on a phone just because it can prop itself up, there are much, much cheaper alternatives out there where you can just put something on the back of the phone, allow it to prop itself up, and yeah, the pop socket will take away wireless charging capability, but guess what? The Duo doesn't have wireless charging anyway. Uh, it doesn't matter if it has a pop socket on it or not. You're stuck with standard old USB-C charging. And to charge $1,400 for a phone that doesn't have wireless charging in 2020, oh God, I do I even have to begin here? Watching YouTube has not been that great because the truth is when you wanna prop it up like this in landscape mode, the bezels on the side are quite large. And what I've noticed is that watching a YouTube video on my iPhone actually results in a larger viewing area. You're able to capture more content than you would on a device like this because no videos are really capable of supporting an aspect ratio like this. Not much that we watch these days. And those big bezels on the side means that there's a lot of black bars around the content. So the actual viewable area of the video is much, much smaller than what you would get with a far cheaper phone. And I hope you guys realize this is not just a battle of I like iPhones and the Surface Duo is not an iPhone because there are way better Androids you can spend your money on. The Pixel 4a has twice the cameras as the Duo and it's $350. And it also has, in my opinion, a better display because it felt responsive, it felt smooth. And maybe it's just me, maybe it's me imagining something, but when I'm scrolling or when I have an app stretched between the two screens, I notice a little bit of a disconnect between the two panels. I see a little bit of screen wobbling. I see a little bit of the displays not matching color accuracy wise. I will see one display look more brownish or yellow than the other. Like they're not in perfect sync a lot of the time. And the other thing that maybe I've just gotten used to with using iOS devices for so long because they have 120 hertz touch sampling and then just straight up 120 hertz period on the iPad Pro is that it feels noticeably behind. It doesn't feel like it's touch sampling at a high refresh rate. It feels like there is noticeable lag when I'm scrolling or when I'm selecting an option and that kind of thing. It feels like it's a little bit behind. If I had to guess what it means, it means that the touch sampling is more like 30 hertz. It just feels a little bit behind me whenever I'm swiping, scrolling, or using some kind of gesture. I just notice it lacking in so many different aspects that I'm like, eh, come on, catch up, catch up. And also there are way better Androids these days that will grant you 120 Hertz displays that are huge that you can watch content on, even do split screen with the giant 6.7 or 6.9 inch displays of today. And you're typically cheaper still than the Surface Duo, which is still locked at 60 Hertz. And I, I, I just can't recommend the displays at all. They're small for content. They come up with all these different configurations
limitations of typing, but the truth is the typing experience has a lot of wasted space. There's a lot of just pixels that are straight up off and not being used, and it doesn't optimize well with the software because if you change something like the volume, it's cut off by the keyboard. Like the software doesn't realize that for one, the volume is backwards. So you're changing the volume and it's going the opposite way of the direction of the volume rockers. But if you bring up the keyboard, it covers up and cuts off the volume indicator, which I guess isn't a huge issue, but still it looks clunky and it looks very, very bizarre on a device of this price point. And the software half the time doesn't even really know what to do. I feel like there's so many different ways to use this, which Microsoft was clearly very proud of. They're like, hey, you can use it like two phones at the same time, just duct tape them together. Or you can use it like a DS and have your controls down here and your display up here. But the displays are still so small that typing on a keyboard like that isn't really much better than typing on a typical phone keyboard anyway. It's just like an ultra wide version of typing on a typical smartphone. It's not like it's a full size keyboard. You're still going to be texting with your thumbs regardless. And if your argument is, well, it's a productivity machine and I can attach like a third party Bluetooth keyboard to this thing, you can attach third party Bluetooth keyboards to any phone. It doesn't just have to be the duo. You can put another phone in landscape mode and have a more reasonable aspect ratio in a detached keyboard if that's what you're going for here. And the truth is it's Android. It's not Windows 10. They try to rub their Microsoft hands over the Android as much as possible. It's definitely not stock. And I look at that as a bad thing. Having just used the Pixel 4a, I thought that was way more reliable and ran way better and way more stable than this did. And apps don't know how to handle all of these different configurations. Half the time it'll be like, hey, you can type in Discord, but there's another app open. So there's no keyboard, even though, you know, the little line is blinking, waiting for you to type. It's like, you don't have any way of typing there. And also sometimes I'll put a YouTube video in picture in picture and I'll swipe it to another screen and it will just go away. It'll just disappear. And I can't seem to find it unless I go to the home screen and open YouTube again. They're also very insistent that no matter which way you're using this device, you have to swipe up from this side to go home. It doesn't matter if a display is being used in its entirety, they won't move the gesture bar to the bottom like you would on an iPad or a typical phone. Like if you're using it in landscape, you swipe up. If you're using it in portrait, you swipe up to go home. Whereas this one, it's like, well, if you're using it like this, you swipe right to go home. Sometimes, sometimes the app just crashes. But if you're using an app like this, you swipe up to go home. And I'm realizing now that the accelerometer is not registering. I guess you gotta hold it this way. There you go. There's been a lot of times, and I wonder if this is inherent design flaw or a software bug that the accelerometer and the gyroscope, they really have no clue how I'm holding the device. I will hold it in a specific way for a while and it's unable to really register that I've flipped it. It's not really registered. Like, hey, hello, there you go. So you have to kind of tilt it down for it to realize, oh, he held me a different way. But compared to my iPad, which I've been using since 2018, that thing knows instantly. If I flip it one way, it will switch. Whereas this will literally take four to five seconds sometimes to register that, hey, I want to use the device in this orientation now. It's like, what? You want to do what? I, I, you, you want, okay. Oh, you want him to flip over. Gotcha. Also, your app just crashed again. If you care very much, much about a clean operating system that doesn't have a lot of bloatware, I can't exactly say this is the device either. They preloaded a lot of apps and started automatically giving me notifications for them. Like they just have LinkedIn built in and started pushing notifications to me saying, hey, you could find a job in your area. Try LinkedIn. And I'm like, My Microsoft, no, just stop. Don't do this. There's also a bunch of apps on here that I have really no intention of using. Like they have the Microsoft Edge app, but also the Bing app. I don't really know what the difference between Bing and Microsoft Edge is, but there's lots of different ways to search. That's probably a good thing though, because as soon as I opened Chrome, the phone started lagging beyond belief or the app would crash or it would stop responding. Thankfully that hasn't happened recently. So maybe some software updates came out and started fixing that thing. But either way, I cannot figure out where the money in this device is going. Why does it cost what it costs? I really don't get it. It's $1,400 before tax. When you're spending that much money on a phone, it's important to keep in mind after tax, Tax, it really ended up costing me $1,500. And that's so high that the Apple card I bought it with didn't even believe me. It was like, we noticed some suspicious activity on your account. We know you're an Apple sheep and we saw you spending that much money at the Microsoft store. We were like, what the heck is wrong with you? So I appreciate it, Apple card. That was a great feature, but yes, I did intend to buy this. But I still, after dropping this much money on a device, don't understand 
where all the money went, okay? The speaker on this thing is atrocious. When you turn it up to full blast, it's about half as loud, and it's also a mono speaker, it's not even stereo. It's just coming from one end of the device, that's it, and half as loud as my iPhone speakers, and probably like 10% as loud as my iPad speakers. Seriously, the amount of sound you can get out of an iPad Pro these days is way, way better than what this thing offers. The camera, there's only one of them, and it's not even that good. Portrait mode is barely different from the regular photo mode, it's not able to really take much high quality pictures the dynamic range is awful the video mode is incapable and there's only one it's not even that they're paying for two separate lenses and one of them is decent and one of them is bad they literally just bought one lens which smartphone companies haven't had to do in basically a decade even the pixel 4a has two cameras and 350 bucks and the snapdragon chip is from over a year ago over a year and a half ago now it was first introduced i think on the galaxy s10 so expecting a multitasking device that's going to be handling all these apps simultaneously and using a near two-year-old chip to power a device of this price point. I don't think they're dropping a lot of money on the Snapdragon chip. Also, this is one of the first devices I think in 2020 that costs over a thousand dollars and doesn't have 5G modems. Not that I care about 5G. In fact, that's probably the best thing. It doesn't have 5G, but the truth is those 5G modems have been why smartphones have gotten so expensive lately. I mean, the Z Fold 2 is expensive, but it does have 5G, but this doesn't even have that. So there wasn't a lot of money that went towards the modems. Uh, the displays are not that impressive. The the touch sampling on them is laggy and sometimes they get out of sync when you're scrolling and they're 60 hertz they're not necessarily that big they're like five and a half inches per screen so combined together you have an eight inch oled display but honestly i don't see why it's that expensive especially when the bezels are this huge you have this giant forehead plenty of space to put i don't know if you wanted to put a home button or the touch id sensor here or you wanted to put a camera at least on both sides so that when you're flipping it around like this and using it in phone mode you could at least you know use a front-facing camera and then flip it around to the rear facing if you want to they didn't even do that the battery is not that large either at around 3600 milliamp hours which I can't say has been super impressive typically if I'm using this thing consistently it will drain a lot faster than my iPhone does that's for sure and it's not a huge surprise considering there's two displays and the battery on the inside is smaller than my iPhone which again is cheaper only six gigs of RAM which compared to other Androids these days you can see 12 to 16 gigs of RAM in typically around the $1,000 price tag, and this is $400 above that, and it starts with 128 gigs of storage. No expandable way, and it maxes out at 256 gig, but given the camera is so dang atrocious, and I doubt anyone buying this thing is really gonna be using the camera for much, I, I don't see you really filling up the 128 gig. I don't know what you're gonna be downloading on this thing. Probably not downloading a bunch of movies and TV shows because the black bars are so huge, it's a terrible speaker. I don't know why you'd be watching a ton of content on here in the first place so I guess the storage thing it's not that high because you're probably not gonna be filling it up but the answer remains that this is a small amount of storage for a device that costs this much so again I ask myself where did the money go where the heck did all of the money why is it so expensive is it literally just the hinge that's the running theory I've had recently is just the fact that they have a hinge on this device and because they have to weave a bunch of cables and wires through that hinge to get the displays to work together and to have electronics on both sides that can communicate that simple hinge part of the device adds all this complexity because in my opinion the specs you get out of a device like this should be costing maybe $500 like I'm genuinely curious how much it costs Microsoft to build something like this and I know they unveiled it last year in the holiday season and said, hey, this is coming next year in 2020. And you know what? There were a lot of people when I first reacted to that that were like, you know what? It's a prototype. They've got a whole year to iron out the kinks. They've got a whole year to optimize the software and make the hardware better. And no, it'll it'll have a much better camera. Yeah, it'll have much better displays and up-to-date specs when they actually launch it. But I don't know, Microsoft, at this point, with the specs you gave it and the price point you gave it, it feels like you're just selling the same thing you unveiled last year. It feels like you unveiled it to the public because you got a lot of clicks and a lot of attention like look everyone folding phone we we kind of made a folding phone but you didn't want to tell anyone the specs or the price point and then you just kind of left it on a shelf for a year and said well uh are we gonna do anything with that and they went 
Uh, yeah, we, we spent a few billion on researching and developing the right type of hinge, but when it comes to displays, camera, software optimization, hardware optimization, it is lazy. It is just straight up lazy to be charging this much for a phone and be putting this basic performance inside of it. Literally. I don't know one other phone this year that came out that is rocking the Snapdragon 855. Whether it's a flagship, whether it's a cheap budget phone, no one else is using that chip. Like, is Qualcomm even still selling these? Like, can you still buy them? Or did Microsoft Microsoft buy a bunch in bulk last year and they're just now implementing them. And in my opinion, if you're asking me what to spend your money on or if a device like this is worth it, I can't tell where the money is going. And don't tell me it went to the software, it went to optimizing Android to be more Microsoft friendly because it's clunky, it's buggy, and apps were crashing right out of the box even though the second I opened the phone it was like you have to install this update. It would not let me open the phone unless I installed that update which did take quite a while. I was sitting there for a full 10 minutes just looking at at that buffering icon just being like installing, installing, restarting, installing, restarting. So I don't think a ton of money or anything went towards the software optimization because for launch day it was really really buggy and weird and third parties definitely don't want to optimize this thing and I don't know if they ever will. There's probably a very very small user base of people that are experiencing issues with Google Apps on the Duo so YouTube and Chrome they're not going to see this as a priority as something they need to fix real quick. You're unable to do mobile payments, you're not able to get good sound, you're not able to have a good viewing experience with videos you're not able to take good pictures you're not able to get outstanding battery life the display is laggy and sometimes unresponsive and you got this giant seam down the middle and yet fourteen hundred dollars is the price they decided on that's what this device is worth i honestly feel like they spent a ton of money on research and development for trying to figure out a device like this kind of gave up halfway through and then realized well we can't really seem to make this any better than the prototype we unveiled last year so let's just start selling it and hopefully that will cover some of our r d costs and then it won't be a colossal failure but in my opinion releasing a product in this state for this price point is kind of sealing the coffin and and I would be kind of surprised at this point if Microsoft decided, you know what, actually, we're gonna make another Surface Duo and it'll be much better. And if they do, it's probably not gonna come out until end of 2021, and then it'll have 2020 specs and probably still be priced incredibly high compared to what other devices you can get at this price margin. Especially if we're in the age of the iPad Air 4, where you can get edge-to-edge -edge display, a 14 chip, Touch ID, an 11 inch display that's much more responsive. And that iPad is probably gonna get six to seven seven years of software support, whereas the Duo will be lucky if we get three, and you're spending 1400 bucks on something that in three years is not going to be getting software updates anymore, and I fully imagine this is going to be something Microsoft kind of forgets exists in a few years. They're like, oh yeah, you guys want updates for that? Oh, uh, well, it has a Snapdragon 855, so uh, it's kind of hard to optimize uh, new versions of Android for this thing, so we're not going to really look at that as a main priority right now. We're going to focus on our Surface tablets and that kind of thing. Honestly, this is not an anti-Microsoft video. Like, that is a better use of your money. Get a Surface Pro. Get a Surface Go. Those things are cheaper. They will let you get more work done, have more productivity-focused apps, and they run Windows 10, which are compatible with m way more productivity applications than Android. This is just, hey, wouldn't it be cool if you can write Microsoft Word or do a PowerPoint on your phone with two screens? Let me be honest with you. Even the apps that Microsoft designed and put on this thing, that they're not super helpful with a dual display design. It's like, ooh, cool you have a few menus on this side and text on this side but then you're still gonna be typing with one finger at a time unless you do it like this in which case the keyboard has a lot of empty space and you're still looking at a very very tiny version of the Microsoft Word application because it's only a five and a half inch display which is smaller than most smartphones anyway and it just becomes the world's tiniest laptop that happens to be slow have terrible speakers and a terrible camera so the fundamental issue I think with the Surface Duo is it doesn't know what it is Microsoft has said on a few tweets that it's a phone, but it's also so much more. And in the event where they announced it, they also said it's not a phone. It's meant to be just a productivity device. And knowing what your product is, knowing what it's for and what it's capable of is kind of important. You need to be able to know, is this a phone? Is this a two-in-one? Is this a hybrid laptop slash tablet? Pick one, you know, make up your mind on something because then apps can design themselves accordingly or people can buy it and review it accordingly and know what they're getting into. This whole 
well, yeah, you know, it's so much more. It's a new platform. We don't know what it is. It results in just a very confusing operating system and a very confusing product because I don't think people are going to buy this thing and another phone just so they can have two big slabs of glass in their pockets that aren't that light and portable. I mean, it fits in your pocket technically, but it's still big in chunk to the point that you're, you're not saving a ton of space this way. And I think most people would much rather just have a phone and then an iPad or just have a Surface Pro or just have another tablet of some sort that they can take out when they want a bigger screen to get more work done and still be portable, but a phone is still capable of getting a lot of work done. You can still check email through that. You can watch YouTube. You can take notes. You can do office editing apps on an Android phone or an iPhone. It's not like this offers a bunch of stuff that a phone can't typically do, except, you know, just having two apps open at the same time. But again, they don't run super well. They're not running super reliably, and it costs way, way more than it would cost to just buy a dedicated tablet, even a small one, even something like an iPad mini, which will be extremely portable, probably even fit in a few people's pockets. And those will get way more software support, save you a ton of money and have a much more consistent, reliable user experience. And the apps that are available on the iPad OS app store will be way more productivity based and run way more reliably than any kind of productivity apps you can find on Android, especially when buying a phone with a two year old CPU at the end of 2020 for 1400 bucks. There's just so many red flags with this thing that I can't understand why a company would work this hard and this long on making a product that we're going into overdrive. Microsoft could never even get Windows 10 updates correctly, so they were always updating devices and corrupting my drivers whenever I had a PC, and now they're doing the same thing with the Service Duo. It's so crashy, it's so laggy, except this time, it's over $1,000, but they can't even adopt NFC wireless charging, water resistance. They can't even put an IP water resistant rating. It's a thin device. Aren't the gaps supposed to be really thin and close together? If you're making a device that's this compact and this thin, you would think water resistance isn't that complicated, but they can't even get that right. 6 gigs of RAM, 128 gigs of storage, Snapdragon 855, our basic specs. This is the kind of performance you would see out of a $500 phone in 2019. Not something you should expect from a $1,400 device coming out at the end of 2020. That means the majority of the Surface Duo's life is going to be competing in 2021 against the iPhone 12s, which are going to be much, much cheaper and have OLED displays, and you're going up against the Galaxy S20 series, S21 series coming out later. Galaxy Z Fold 2 is probably a way better deal as is, even though it's more expensive. You're getting so much more and a more consistent experience because there's not a seam down the middle in a crit. Drew, what are you doing? I'm filming... I'm filming my Microsoft Surface Duo video. I, I have to I have to rant on this. I I need to explain why this is so crazy. You're so loud. Can you please quiet down? I'm sorry. Yeah, I can I can be more quiet. Thank you. I love you. I love you too. Anyway, this device is not worth your time, it's not worth your money. Definitely was not a high priority at Microsoft's team. They didn't want to ensure that it was a quality experience and they didn't want to ensure that the hardware on the inside could last. So that's why you should not prioritize it. You should not act like this is the second coming of Christ just because it unfolds like a book. And because it's technology and looks like a book, that means it's the future. It's not that simple, ladies and gentlemen. It's not just for the fact of it looks cool that a product will get my endorsement or get my excitement. I have to see functionality. I have to see logic. I have to see why a device in this particular fashion is worth that price tag. And even in time, if you think that they're gonna make it cheaper and you think that they're gonna make the specs better, the truth is the platform in itself is flawed. It's way too early. We're not ready for foldable displays like this, even so that they have this hinge down the middle with a gap. If Microsoft tried to start doing the foldable display thing like the Galaxy Fold, it would probably start even costing more. It would be more expensive than it is now. And then we would have durability problems and this hinge mechanism probably wouldn't work as well because it likes to go completely flat when folded up like this and that would not allow the device to age very well. So Microsoft, if you're thinking of making another generation of these things, you have a long way to go. You have so many improvements to make that honestly, I think all of that work and all of that R&D you would have to do to make the Duo somewhat usable, putting in more RAM, putting in a better processor, improving the displays to be more edge to edge, all of that stuff. Why don't you just make a normal phone? I know it's not as exciting or probably as groundbreaking to be like, look everyone, hinge it folds it flies like a butterfly that means it's the future just make a normal glass rectangle with microsoft apps and high quality hardware and you know there's there's a lot of things samsung and google aren't exactly doing right that everyone loves so i would be more than happy to see microsoft throw in their approach to a typical android flagship with good specs at a reasonable price and just do your whole microsoft skin thing but optimize it a little bit more and just make a surface phone okay it has like a little kickstand on the back so you can prop it up and watch videos 
videos on it with actual stereo speakers and have IP water resistance and you could also get into the camera game and computational photography. I have nothing against that. I get that it's maybe not as exciting, but still, I would be all in favor of seeing Microsoft try to do something like that. And in my opinion, there's way too many companies that are in a huge hurry to try to make the new thing. They want to make the next platform. They want to leapfrog smartphones in some way, but they don't think them through. They don't put the effort into them that was put into the original iPhone or the original iPad. They don't put that kind of money and that kind of research into it. And that's why you get half-baked experiences like this. And it's so simple to just buy two separate devices that will get a better experience than this for cheaper. That's just the end of the day problem. No, the iPad can't fold up and fit in my pocket, but that's what I have an iPhone for. And if you're trying to replace my phone, then you have to have phone features. If this could have on par performance and on par features of a flagship phone and also offer kind of basic tablet features, that'd be a different discussion. But in this situation, it's like crappy phone. You wouldn't spend $500 on this device in this shape with these specs if all it did was have a phone and you wouldn't spend $600 or $700 on a tablet this small with these types of specs and a line down the middle, you wouldn't spend that much money on a tablet. So yeah, of course, when you combine two crappy, weird products into one very expensive crappy product, that doesn't warrant the price tag. And we've had foldables since the beginning of 2019 now, okay guys? We're getting out of the realm of, well, first generation, it's early technology. Well, having a hinge with two displays isn't exactly new, you know? We've had things like the LG G8X, which in my opinion, that's a much smarter approach to just have an optional accessory. Have a regular phone, but if you want to add an extra display to it for multitasking purposes, you can, but building it into the device so that it's standard and it has to be a dual display device just makes it clunky, makes it expensive and not worth our time. In my opinion, it's far more interesting if you want to make, you know, a regular smartphone with thin bezels and a great design and good specs, but also sell a $200, $300 accessory that allows you to attach a secondary phone to it and then you can have somewhat of a tablet like experience but this ain't it this ain't it I don't recommend it I'm not happy with it and hope you guys know that at the end of the day my rants are for entertainment purposes if you like the duo I genuinely hope it works well for you okay I'm not gonna hate you I'm not mad at anyone who likes the duo I just I don't understand its price I don't understand its target market but if you found that you like it and you love it that's great I'm happy for you I'm all in favor of people finding the devices that work best for them I just have no clue how you could buy the Surface Duo and be like, this, this does exactly what I need that no other device can do. The Microsoft Surface Duo pushes the limits of the imagination backwards. But yeah, other than that, I really like it. It's a great product. Thanks for watching. This is your Apple Shapir. I'll see you in the next one.